There are a lot of organizations around the world of music licensing that are really important to get involved with, but there are a few that really take the cake for me as must-haves. You've really got to get and become a part of certain organizations. One I've talked about before is the Guild of Music Supervisors. Another one is the Production Music Association. They do so many great things for composers and artists and publishers. And if you're serious about licensing your music, you absolutely need to be involved. So let's talk more about that. Welcome to the License Your Music podcast, where I'm here to give you all the tools you need to license your music to film, TV, ads, trailers, video games, and more so that you can earn passive income doing what you love. I'm your host, Jody Friedman. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Whether you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or watching with me here on YouTube, I so appreciate you. Make sure you come by our site, get on our list, grab that free guide. Right now, it's how to get your music heard by music supervisors. I'm about to switch it out with a new guide, but there's always free stuff on the site, so make sure you come by, licenseyourmusic.com. Check that out. The Production Music Association, such an important part of the business and and so many, they do so many things for composers and producers and publishers, like I mentioned. My guest today is Morgan McKnight. Morgan McKnight is the executive director of the Production Music Association, which manages comprehensive initiatives surrounding the production music industry. The association is also responsible for founding the prestigious Production Music Conference and the Mark Awards, which has become the international meeting place for the production music community, representing 30 countries and counting. McKnight got her start in marketing, communications, and event development, and held various prominent positions working in the field for both corporate and nonprofit organizations. She ultimately decided to pursue a graduate degree in music industry administration at Cal State Northridge, where a former attorney and CSUN professor, Steve Winogradsky, introduced her to the world of publishing. McKnight now works with composers and production music publishers all over the world in order to advance the unique value of production music and ensure a better future for the entire community. Morgan, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Jody. It's so great to be here and really, really great to see you. You as well, always good to see you. Tell me or tell our audience more about what I already know and love about the Production Music Association, just a broad summary, and we'll take it from there. Sure. Yeah. So the PMA or the Production Music Association is a nonprofit. We're a membership based association. I'd like to look at it as like a trade uh, association. Uh, We represent and I say represent kind of lightly, but we work in, in very specifically in the field of production music. So library music, production music. And we have composers and we have publishers, uh, publisher members, library members within the space. Um, And we all collectively advocate and and work together to advance the value of production music. Um, It it is such an interesting space because uh, production music libraries are technically publishers. They're publishers. They're in the publishing world. Um, But there are a lot of nuances and a lot of things that are are different (laughs) in the production music space that isn't necessarily applicable to traditional publishers. So um, we represent the, the best interests, the best interests, excuse me. Um, for both libraries and and composers, anybody working in that field. Yeah, and it's it's fascinating because there's a lot of uh, people in our audience that license your music that are str- still trying to figure out where they fit in and what path they need to go down. And some of them, I say, it sounds like you would be best suited to be a library composer. And others, I say, you you don't really seem like a library composer. You're more of an artist and just kind of keep doing your artist thing and and go down that path. But there is crossover. There's definitely some crossover, I would think, and benefits for even those artist types to come to um, and learn uh, from the the PMA and what they have to offer. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, in the world of content that we live in, right, and and just mounds and mounds and mounds of content everywhere, there's absolutely going to be crossover. Um, I think what's really interesting is it's, You know, production music can be and is a a full time job for a lot of people and full time income and all of those those things that we look for as musicians, musicians and composers. But it also is supplemental. 
income. So if you talk about artists and others that, that maybe have, you know, hit records or whatever, you know, we'll, we'll go there if we want to go there. Um, it's supplemental. It's anything to kind of add residual income into kind of what you're already doing. So there's definitely like multiple lanes, even within production music, it can be, you know, like I said, a supplemental side thing, um, for tracks that maybe didn't get accepted, um, to direct to music supervisors or, you know, or to directors or things like that, that kind of find their way into libraries and then get licensed out that way. Or it can be, you know, you could be a prominent production music composer and do albums and be commissioned for trailers and, and things like that, um, within the space. So it's, there are a lot of levels, um, to being a production music composer. You can, take advantage of one or two or all of, of the opportunities within it. But I, I, you know, I think it's such a great space uh, for so many people, whether you're an artist or, or, you know, a film and TV or media composer, you're trying to get into that space because we cover everything, right? We cover everything. We cover everything from trailers to the smallest social media ads to, to anything. So um, it's music for media. That That's really what the space that we're in. And that's where the music goes <laughs> into media. Yeah. Whatever that is, that's where it goes. So that's right. And I'm so glad you, you bring that up because it's uh, a lot of uh, artists, especially when you're starting out and finding your way, you kind of, you put yourself in a box and to your point, you don't have to, you can, you know, do your artist thing and, and then have a pseudonym as your production music pseudonym that where you, you finance your artist career through production music. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll say yes, 100%. You can absolutely finance that. I, you know, I think it's, you know, be careful if, if you're an artist and you're signed exclusively to a publisher, obviously this is a whole different conversation, but if you're, you know, independent mind, um, yeah, I mean, why not, uh, put your eggs in different baskets, right? Like there's, there's nothing stopping you. Um, the production music space, there's, there's two routes to really go. There's a millions of routes. So this is two yeah. prompt routes. Uh, exclusive and non-exclusive libraries exist, right? So when I talk about like the exclusive model, and I just mentioned like if you're an artist signed exclusively to a publisher and you're signed exclusively as an artist, and this this is that that's a completely different situation. But how it works in production music is that your songs are licensed exclusively. So I can have 10 songs in one library, 10 songs in another library, 10 songs in another library, and all of those can be working together to build my income source or, or my revenues and just in general quarterly, right? As long as the songs are exclusive to, to said library, but then there's also the non-exclusive route that, you know, in which case you can put songs, dabble them in all wherever, <laughs> wherever in the non-exclusive world. And, and, you know, just again, anything to to start generating the placements. And I think too, you know, as placements or as you get credits, right, it, it helps your career kind of a you know, domino effect from there and puts you on a, a track towards, you know, five placements, 10 placements, 100 placements. And then soon enough, you know, you, you have some residual income there. 100%. You've got to make sure that your tracks are are ready. And if you can produce quality and you you can package them a certain way and market them a certain way, you can give it to multiple libraries, but it's exclusive with that library and ex these 10 are exclusive with another. And uh, I think that's brilliant. And uh, some of the most successful composers that I come across, they do just that. And they also dabble in the non-exclusive stuff too with different songs. They keep it all separate. So thinking in those um, different compartments or buckets, uh, it's like diversifying a portfolio. You want to diversify where your songs are invested, just like you would diversify where you invest your money with stocks. It's a, it's a similar uh, mentality. I was say that. Yeah, it's definitely just compartmentalize your stuff in different places and let it work for you the same way the stock market does. I mean, it's, it's exactly, yeah, you, you nailed it. I was just going to say that. Well, so tell me about, you, you mentioned before we, we started talking here, something about um, there are three things that the production music, the PMA stands, uh, it's, there are three pillars that they stand on. What are those pillars? And let's talk about those. Absolutely. So we work under uh, education, advocacy, and community as an association, right? Member-based again, just to membership-based. So, you yeah. know, first and foremost is community. So let's start there. Um, from a community standpoint, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, we're fostering the, the specific production music community, right? Like there's, the music business and like I said, the publishing business in its whole, in, in entirety is a big space. Um, their media, music for media is a big space. 
um, you know, composers and, and like film score and other, you know, that, that they work a bit differently. Like those contracts, those deals are different than, than production music specifically. So we exist to um, represent and work, you know, for the composers and the publishers within this specific space. So that community as everything from, you know, our, like I said, our, our publishers and our composers, but also uh, the PROs and um, any tech partners or business partners or, or royalty solution providers or any, anybody in the space that's really benefiting and helping the production music community specifically. Um, you know, we, we do anything from connecting composers with potential publishers to connecting composers with composers to uh, helping libraries find sub publishers and other territories and kind of any and all of those things, um, all of that in between too. So um, that, you know, community, that's, that's community. Um, educationally, oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Well, no, well, that that's huge. I mean, just to to expand upon that a little bit, um, I found most of my sub publishers through the PMA, my international sub publishers. So one hundred percent, and and uh, those who are so, so some of our listeners are already taking my world tour course, where I'm interviewing a lot of those sub publishers, and they're talking about that. I would not have that without the PMA. PMA it allowed me by having that community and creating that safe space for us all to come and gather and meet one another and learn so much through this, what you're going to go into now, which is the education part, but that community set the, it was, it was like an open door. Come on in, come and meet everybody. It's, it's, it's a really great community and it truly is. It truly is. Everyone's so nice and welcoming and it's just a great space to hang out with your peers and meet people. It's fun. Thank you. Yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, I think that, you know, there are so many, there's a lot of like negative connotation with music as far as like the helpfulness, right? It's it's competitive. There is no doubt about it. It's competitive. The music space in general. And then if you narrow that into music for media, well, <laughs> you know, it's just as competitive. Um, and it's saturated. There are a ton of composers and a ton, like it's, it's saturated, but yeah. what's really special, I think. And, and, you know, I, I, I hope that all of our members can attest to this is the production music space are all, they're all competitors, but they also are all colleagues. So like, for example, APM music, who's the largest, uh, library in North America is a joint venture between universal and Sony. So and Universal and Sony both have North American present, you know, like they're, they're libraries in North America. So it, it's, just, I always use that example because it's just such a funny, like that, that, ex, that really exemplifies what the space looks like. Right. like it's friendly competition. It's friendly, friendly competition. competition. And yeah. we all kind of want to help each other. And in general, we're really helping the space, right? Like we're helping the industry itself within the larger publishing perspective. So Yes, great community. Um, and it ties into what Jody was saying about um, bringing people together and, and sit and talk. I mean, this is the educational aspect of it, right? So, you know, normally we have a, a conference every year in the fall that brings 700 to 800 people from 35 plus countries um, with all production mu music related. That's called the PMC for those of you that, that don't know about it. Um, and that has become a space for people to to really engage and, and meet each other and talk to each other. But it also then um, hits that educational point, too. So we have panels and keynotes and any of these things that are helpful and um, timely um, considering, you know, trends or, or business developments or any of the things that, you know, we need to talk about as an industry um, that carries over now, you know, virtually as, as most others do. To, to webinars and, and, you know, uh, coffee meets online to hang out and talk and just, you know, share information. We have board meetings all the time and meetings with Netflix and meetings with PROs and all of these things that we're doing that leads into the advocacy portion of it. But all of these things that, that we're doing and working on on behalf of the community. Um, and it's, it's a space for us to grow. It's a space for us to, to, as an industry collectively grow and not just, yeah. you know, uphold the value, right? Like we're in a, a situation with digital, like the rest of the music space where, you know, value is in question. There, there are companies that, you know, undermine and kind of devalue our business. And so it's, it's not just about upholding the value, but also advancing it because production music, you know, even 10 years ago, but 20 years ago was, was simple. It was, jingles it was instrumental there wasn't much 
the production value wasn't anywhere near what it is today. Yeah. Um, and we see such a space, such a growth in the space as far as quality and, and songs and lyrics and all of these things that didn't used to be a thing. So it's not just upholding that value. It's really like advancing the value to advance with the quality of music that we're seeing. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, so educationally, I mean, any of these things that, that come up that, that we have to, to help and, and you know, talking to, to younger composers or composers in the space that are new that may not know what standard deals are or you know, have a, a, a library or somebody approaching them with a deal or an offer that takes all of the writer share, for example, you know, things like that, that we have to constantly be talking about. Um, and I wish that it was just common, you know, common knowledge or broadcasted and plastered everywhere. Oh, not gosh, I know. I know. But it's, it's, it's yeah. to have these conversations, you know? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, there's so many, we probably could talk for hours about all these different different things. But, you know, one of the main things I, I hear or I encounter a lot. And I remember back, I think back on when I was starting out and reading these books, you get these books on music publishing and one of the things, or, or being a songwriter in the music business. And one of the things you read is never give up your publishing. Don't, you know, if you, if you're doing that, they're sharks. So you get this red flag on thinking, okay, anyone who asks for my publishing, it is shark, but that's not the way it works in production music. It's just not the standard. So having that education and knowing that that's a it's different. That may be how it works when you're, um, I don't know, trying to get signed to a label. If they want your publishing, that's very unusual. But, you know, in the production music space, it's different. It's so different. It's so normal. I can't. Yeah, I'm I'm the amount of times in, in like Facebook forums or other places where I've had to, to just say or, you know, where people have asked this publisher is asking for 50% of my publishing. Is that normal? Is that okay? Like, it seems like a red flag and it's just like, it's, are they asking for your writer share? No, completely standard. Completely right. That's standard. what it's there for. That's what it's there for, for the, it, for the publisher to do their thing and exploit it. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, what, what people don't maybe know or, or take into consideration is that also means that that library is doing all of your admin work. So it gives you the time to really focus in on that creativity and that composition. Like if you want to be a composer and you don't want to like have a publishing company, for example, like you're just a creative being and you want to be creative. Well, let the library do the admin stuff for you. Let them do the metadata. Let them do the the split sheets and the cue sheets. You know what I'm saying? Like let them, let them do all of that for you so that you can create and just get your royalty checks and then your, you know, 50 face splits or whatever your contract says. So it's, there's so much that goes into it from an admin perspective that I think that people don't really realize. And then, you know, on top of that, just the, the, the network and the clients themselves that libraries have, I mean, you're saving, yes, you're giving up 50% of your publishing and for to, to go on record, 50% of your publishing is standard. 50, 50 deals are, is what was, would be standard in the production music space. Um, so you give them that, that publishing, but they're going to generate a lot quicker for you. They're going to generate, you know, probably more than you would be able to, to generate on your own. Um, I mean, if you don't have libraries, obviously, yes, you have sync agents, you have other ways to go about it. Um, and they have clients, but you basically are doing kind of that heavy lifting yourself, right. And meeting clients and pitching to Netflix or, you know, whatever the case may be. So there's, you know, there's pros and cons, but which takes a long time to build those relationships and, and nurture them. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into the the business side of it too. So yeah, there are, there are artists who are willing to, to, you know, grit their teeth and just go through it and do it. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's hard work, but then if you're not, if you want to focus on the creative and I look back to when I was starting out, Morgan, I was, uh, you know, an artist and I decided to do it myself. If I knew now, Knew then what I know now, would I do it the same? I don't know. I might focus on the creative and actually just, you take care of the business. You take care of all that admin. I'm just going to write songs and produce and, you know, I'll, I'll focus on honing my skills there because I think I'd be in a different place and be able to create more. And now I, I have a lot of admin to do as a publisher. There's so much to it. So uh, 100%. So let's talk about the advocacy part of it. You guys advocate for composers and you touched on it. And I think you were, you were hinting at royalty free libraries and how they're devaluing the, the music space for production music. And I also want to add, as we go into that production music, when there are going to be artists that have their music used in productions that are not in the production music space. 
And then there's the production music space, which is really built around libraries and composers that create music solely or, or no, I shouldn't say solely because we talked about segmenting and having pseudonyms, but yeah. specifically for productions. And that's very different from like a, a Sharon Van Etten or Black Keys. And they're, they're artists whose music gets licensed to productions, but it's not considered production music. 100% production music is like very, there's, there's a style, like it's, you have edit points, you have tension, you have like, the, you know, depending on the genre and what it's for, right. You have rises and fault, like there's clear edit points and they help tell a story and it's a whole different type of composition. Like it's not just a song. It's not, it's not just a song. There are, it's very clearly and intently created for a production with those edit points, with those hits, drum, you know, all these things that you can. Cut downs, all, all versions, yeah. all, all of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, advocacy, do you want to go? go there? Yeah, no. Yeah. Let's, let's segue in, you know, with that in mind, just, um, in making that clear to all of our listeners and, and viewers here. Um, so they understand kind of where they're, where they fit in. So let's talk about the royalty free music space and how that's disrupting, um, the production music space, because that's something you guys advocate really against, right? We or advocate, no. we advocate for a certain standard. Um, and that is to solely to protect the creatives and the space, right? And, and the so, you know, if you are a composer and you sign away all of your rights, it, it, royalty, there's so many, there's definition, the definitions are all over, all over the place. But um, if you essentially are giving up your writer share or saying, you know, here you own all of this, including the publishing and the writers for an upfront fee, um, the, you miss out as an artist, potentially you miss yeah. out on the royalties on the back end that, you know, are essentially your retirement, that that's your long-term salary. Um, you know, the the royalty free space is very interesting, especially right now because of YouTube influencers and, and, you know, any of these other spaces that, that, you know, aren't necessarily monetized, um, correctly or, or there's lacks of data or whatever the holdup or, or whatever prevents them from being, um, monetized and, and, and distributing royalties for, for usage. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's it, kind of a new media wild west still I think they're still yeah. figuring out how to properly monetize that. Yeah. And yes. And, and if they can even get the data from some of these digital services. So it's, it, when I say, when I say that the business models like that devalue um, our business, it really is because composers and artists and creatives are then going to be missing out on what could be a potentially significant back end yeah. that just accumulates over time. Um, you know, there are people that I know that, um, I won't say, I can't say anything specific. Yeah. <laughs> there are people that I know that make like six figure royalty, yeah. make six figures, a royalty statement, a check. So a quarter, right. They're making six figures a quarter. Yeah. They, they had been presented with, you know, a, a buyout situation from a network and all of that would have been gone you know, for, for what, for maybe a $15,000 payment up front. So you're talking about, you know, six figures a quarter that you would be in royalties on. in, in royalties, correct right. royalties yeah. from the PROs. So from performance, yeah. performance royalties, um, yeah. that you'd be missing out on that you would have taken that, you know, 15,000 or whatever, 10,000, 20,000. I mean, shoot, I'll even go a hundred thousand upfront payment, right? Let's go right. high. You get $100,000 upfront. That sounds great. It is great. It's not, you know, it's not the worst amount of money I've ever seen in this space, but it, if, you, you're talking about once <laughs> you get it once yeah. versus four times a year, if not more, depending on, you know, where you're collecting. So it, it you're you specifically know. talking about someone actually selling their writer's share, right? I'm talking about, yeah, that it, where, where I'm, yes, I'm all the rights. So complete, even if buyout, it's complete yeah. buyout. Yeah, complete buyout. Um, even if it's like a work for hire, right? But then they buy it out and you don't retain any of your writer's share. So right. um, if you give up all of your rights and, you know, very specifically your writer's share, 
you, yes, the, the, uh, the, the possibility of you missing out on back end royalties that would be your retirement or your long term, you know, the, the long, the longevity in the space, right? You miss out on that. You get a one. Right. You, you, you want to consider saying, how about I take 50,000, but keep my writer's share. You guys get, so you don't give, you don't forego the placement. You guys get 50,000. You keep that money. I'll just keep my writer's share. You take the publishing share and call it a day. Yeah. I mean, yes. And so when I say that, you know, we advocate for a specific standard uh, in the business, it is that it's, we advocate for you retaining 100% of your writer share. Um, We advocate for, for not, you know, buyouts are are also a subjective term and the definitions are all over the place, but we advocate, you know, to, to, for a 50, 50 split and a a very standard 50, 50 split in publishing 50, 50 split in sync fees, and then a hundred percent of your writer share. So It's, it's a standard that we advocate for. Um, obviously, the market is the market, and there's a, a place and a need for all, all people and all things. But yeah. um, the, the long term of you retaining your writer share is worth it, even though it may take longer, right? It may take you know, a bit longer to, to see the return on that investment, but it's worth it in the long run. And it does tie into what we commented on with the royalty freak companies that are out there for the YouTube content, ID people, YouTube producers that are going to these, these websites that are using royalty free music. There are no royalties. You're, you're giving up your royalties by giving it to them. And down the line that could change and there could be royalties. In fact, I, I think I've seen now on my, on my ASCAP statements, they're starting to generate some royalties for YouTube usages. So it's already happening. It's coming around. So you, you want to be careful about that. And, um, you know, it's kind of that that approach of car- compartmentalizing. If you're going to do it, do it for this batch of songs, but make sure you don't do it for everything and try out other things, too, and, you know, figure out what works. Yeah, you make a really great point. And this is a good just, you know, a, a tidbit right for on the advocacy angle from what we have worked on and what we do work on over here is things like, um, you know, commercials, promos and advertising in uh, in the digital space, so on Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and, you know, TikTok, whatever, like any and all of these service providers that are all streaming, Peacock, yeah. HBO, Max, Now, Go, whatever, like all of these services. It's everything, everything now. I know. It's- so as it is, as it stands, right, as it stands, there's no payments for, for commercials, promos, and adverts on any of those platforms. There's no payments. They don't have the... They don't have the data or they're not getting the data. Yeah. And when I say they, I mean the, the performing rights organizations. Um, but we finally, you know, started to, to make some headway there and start we finally like suggested some proxies and some things that they, you know, can, can try from the, the PROs can try to implement with the, the Netflixes and the Peacocks and others to start seeing payments on some of these things. So, you know, it, we have to, things are going to change. Yeah. And I think that the, that some of these sites and, you know, we talk about micro licensing and any of these, I think that yeah. the PROs are a bit slow in, in adopting, especially in tech, right? Like their, their tech is much quicker than the music business. We've seen that over and over and over again, yeah. but eventually it catches up to an extent um, and then catches up, you know, it takes some time, but it catches up. So to bank on things staying the way they are right now when there are, you know, not just the PMA, but the SCL and other, the NMPA, other associations that are um, really fighting for like as big as legislatively, right? Fighting for legislative change or, or, you know, just digital, anything, any change within that space. um, It's going to happen in my opinion. And this is, you know, I'm not a, 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 genie i can't tell the future but i would imagine that there's going to be a shift and i do not think that it's going to stay the way that it is right now forever um as far as it kind of being this this big free you know market there will be royalties eventually there will be changes to the systems the proxies like it's going to shift um and And you want to think long term you want to think well, even when you create a song, you don't want to think about what can I make tomorrow? You want to think, what am I going to make for the rest of my life on this song? And what are my grandkids going to make from this song? It's a long-term piece of IP that you're creating when you create a song and when you record a song. Absolutely. 100%.
Yeah. It has to be. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but it should. <laughs> well, it should be. It should be. You should. You should yeah. yeah. If, when you're going for the quick run. Yeah, when, when, when I've seen, you know, people create and when I used to do it and go for the quick fix, it's like you sacrifice the quality and you don't you don't think about the big picture. And if you can step back and really imagine, imagine yourself 10 years from now having this catalog of songs that are really amazing songs or amazing records that you, you've begun building some copyright value for. Yeah. And when you give it away to a royalty free company, um, you give up the, that that value. And I'll add that music supervisors can't use these royalty free companies because their contracts are not amenable to what the production companies need them to be. So whenever there's a, a royalty free song in uh, a piece of a, a piece of content that I'm working on, I have to replace it because it's we can't use it. That goes for for big networks. It, I mean, that goes for for generally where the larger dollars are. Generally, obviously, there are exceptions, and we all know that there are exceptions. Generally, where the bigger money is, is is exactly what you said. It's not in non exclusive. It's not in royalty free. It, it is generally in the exclusive libraries or you know exclusive ex exclusivity, exclusivity where yeah. you retain your writer share. You retain some of your rights. Like that. That's where the money is, anyways. I love your passion, Morgan, and uh, your advocacy for for composers and artists. It's it's uh, it's refreshing. There's there's only so many people in the business like you. You are you are one of a kind. So uh, thank you, thank you for everything you do. Oh, and, thank uh, you. Yeah. It's my pleasure. I mean, I this is such a special. It's such a special industry, um, and I you know I, I should say I've been with the PMA for five and a half years. So when I, you know, first started, it was, it was new to me. I didn't know the space either, but like, I didn't even, I didn't know. <laughs> I was like, what, what is production music? But having been in it now and like really, truly immersed in it, like over my head immersed in it for five and a half years. I mean, it's, this is a unique group, um, both, you know, creatively and from the business perspective, like it's a really, really special group of people. And I do think that they are you know, composers specifically, I do think that production music composers are underrepresented. I do think that they are taken advantage of. I do think that they, you know, are lied to a lot yeah. by, by libraries, by networks, by people in general. Like, I think there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of people misleading um, composers and, and creatives. And I just, it's unfortunate because you know, music, like the composers and the music is really even the backbone of the publishers, right? The, the, the music is the library. You don't, can't, you don't have a library without the music. So to, to give composers and creatives a safe space to feel like they um, have a voice and that there's somebody on their side and that there's people fighting for them, and that there are publishers who are aligned with the same thinking because... Yeah all of the majors are, I think, you know, the, the, the big libraries and some of the great libraries out there are all aligned with the same thinking and they're not going to screw you over. They're yeah. not going to, you know, they're not going to treat you poorly. Like all, all of these things, you're going to get placements and royalties and all of these things, you know, over time. Um, and I just, you know, I genuinely want this space to feel protected and feel safe and, and, and feel like it's a, you know, a career path and a long term for for some people and you know whatever yeah. we can do to amplify the voices of composers or, or production music in even the quality i mean even internally in the music business itself right like amplifying the perception of library music and production music is is things that we work on so it's yeah. you know it's music production music it's music it's just music period it's music so, yeah. for productions sure yeah, we just, yeah. We have treated as such right so there's yeah. a lot of work that we do but it, it's really my pleasure and an honor to, to be within the community so how do uh people get involved if they want to sign up yes so uh we have composer membership levels we have student membership levels that i think you know i'm i'm we've been very active in starting to like kind of talk to schools a lot more and really get in on the, the bottom floor um to combat some of this misinformation and things that are out there so we have student memberships we have composer memberships, and we also have library memberships. Um, all of the information is available on what the membership looks like, what the benefits are on our website. That is pmamusic.com. Um, and then if anybody has questions 
on membership levels or just the production music space itself in general, um, anyone can reach out to me directly. My email is morgan at pmamusic.com. Um, so you can put that in the notes, I think, or. Yeah, I, um, I'll put it. I will do. Absolutely. Yeah. And feel free reach out to me for anything questions. If you have a library that's offering you a certain deal and you're not sure if it's a good idea, ask me, I'm happy to give you an answer. Um, whatever, whatever comes up. I'm, I'm here. I'm a resource for this space. I would love to be utilized as such. So whatever anybody needs. The production music association and Morgan McKnight. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and uh, just being here showing up. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you so much. The Production Music Association is such an important part of our community here. Thank you so much for listening. If you're still listening, we appreciate it. Uh, If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please leave us a review. That helps us out a ton. And if you're on YouTube, comment below. Let us know what you thought of this video. And make sure you come by LicenseYourMusic.com. We've got all sorts of training on there. Our masterclass is gonna open up again sometime this year. So come by and get on the wait list. Our music licensing masterclass. We've got our world tour where we take you around the world and you learn about the state of music licensing in eight countries around the world, which pertains to what we spoke about today. And of course, our training on how to get your music heard by music supervisors and all sorts of goodies on the website. So come by LicenseYourMusic.com. I appreciate you. Stay cool. Peace.